It's been four years since Breath of the Wild made its debut, and Nintendo's bold reinvention of the Zelda series is still utterly captivating. Why? Well, there are plenty of big reasons, like the sheer player freedom of its foundation, the fact that you can scale any cliff you can see, paraglide in any direction you choose, or tackle the game's divine beasts in any order you wish. In a lot of ways, however, it's the smaller things that have helped to keep Breath of the Wild so entertaining for so long. Its world and its systems are absolutely crammed with secrets to stumble upon and interactions to discover. You can be 200 hours into this game and still come across something new. This video is a celebration of 150 tiny but important things that have surprised and delighted Breath of the Wild players over the last four years. You may already know most of these, but let us know in the comments which were new to you. Now, on with the show. Or should I say, Mo? Breath of the Wild wouldn't be a Zelda game if Link's swords couldn't cut grass. But this extends to all slicing weapons, including two-handed blades and boomerangs. Jabby lances like spears or blunt instruments like sledgehammers, meanwhile, have no effect. Sorry, Link, can't touch this. But you can torch this. Burnt grass will become blackened, giving a visual indication of your pyromaniacal tendencies. Insects and lizards live in the grass too. In fact, wherever you go, Hyrule is bursting with native life. Swords and bladed weapons also chop down trees, and as we found out right at the start of the game, you can use this to bridge gaps. Link isn't the only godlike entity that can strike down trees. Lightning can as well. Lightning can strike just about anywhere too, whether there's metal around or not. Link's spin attack doesn't have to be charged up. You can actually just rotate the left analog stick and tap the attack button to do a quick spin. As an added bonus, this uses up very little stamina, but it can make Link look a little goofy. Speaking of which, it's also fun draining all of Link's stamina and trying to charge a spin attack with his sword. Or a spear. Or a cork leaf. Oh Link, you adorable lush. Paying attention to Link's stamina is critical while climbing, but one literally life-saving thing to know is that you can wait until the very last sliver of stamina before doing your final leap to try and reach the summit. If the stamina bar is red, the leap will be extra high. It's kind of crazy just how far that last lunge can take you. And if you don't reach the top and Link is suddenly falling to his death, well, you can always fast travel away. You can avoid drowning this way too. Once you reach the top of a mountain, if you see a snowball, give it a hand. And why not take the stylish way back down? Not only is shield surfing a lot of fun, but there's more to it than initially meets the eye. You can use R to do sharper turns, for instance, and you can jump, paraglide, and do tricks. You can also fire a bow. Not only that, surfaces are slicker in the rain, making surfing easier than in the dry. Going further, some shields are simply better for surfing than others. The Ancient Shield, for instance, has way less friction than most, making it a smooth ride on grass and even letting you surf in places other shields won't. The Radiant Shield is also fantastic, but it won't last as long. The Shield Surf animation also extends Link's jump slightly which can be handy. And that's not the only surfing in the game, of course. And why not celebrate your racing victory by tossing your partner some apples to eat? Staying in the Grudo Desert, Link is cooler in the shade than in the scorching sun. <sighs> Get back in the shade, Link. Actually, let's take a selfie first. Oh, you're not into it. <laughs> this visual indication that Link is too hot or too cold also carries over to the inventory screen just to really ensure you won't miss it. There are some great in-game animations too. I also love that you can drop Link's temperature just by equipping ice elemental weapons, like a blizzard rod or a frost spear. Knocking your bow with an ice arrow will not work, incidentally, nor will holding items you'd think would be cold, like white choo-choo jelly. Similarly, you can raise Link's temperature with fire elemental weapons. These can also melt ice blocks without expending any weapon durability or having to waste fire arrows. Check out this Bokoblin trying to melt his friend out of a block of ice. He's nothing if not persistent. Okay, I'm sick of waiting. Let's help him out. Reunited at last. Another way to raise Link's temperature is to stand near a cooking pot or campfire. Both, however, will go out in the rain. Wait, wait, wait. 
Check it out. I've never noticed Link's falling asleep on his feet idle animation before. Campfires are a great way to pass the time while it's raining. You just need to find shelter before lighting it. Campfires can be useful in other ways too. If you set three close together, sometimes four, you get an instant updraft. You can also set grass on fire to create an updraft, or even shoot a spicy pepper with a fire arrow. Updrafts don't just lift Link and his paraglider, they also lift any objects on the ground. <laughs> Let's talk about food. Death Mountain is so hot you can cook food just by dropping it. Leave it too long, however, and it'll burn to ash. In the coldest conditions, when the weather is snowy, meat will freeze if left on the ground. You can hard boil an egg almost instantly by dropping it into a hot spring. Other food won't cook, however, so no sous vide for you. The main benefit of hot springs, of course, is their restorative effect for Link. If you kill an animal with a fire arrow, or three, you'll get seared meat, even if you're in a bitterly cold environment. Similarly, ice arrows produce frozen meat. Any roasted or chilled meat in your inventory is treated as a meal, so it can only be eaten, not cooked with. <sighs> Breath of the Wild has well over a hundred dishes you can cook, but there are a few basic rules. Anytime you turn an ingredient into a meal, you'll double the hearts you'd get out of it if it was raw. <laughs> Cooking with campfires and other means only multiply by one and a half. Using a cooking pot will also activate any bonus effects, like attack up or defense up. <laughs> but if you use ingredients with different additional properties, they'll cancel each other out. If you really want to get the most out of a status effect, toss in a dragon horn. Your buff will last for a full 30 minutes. Fangs, claws, and scales also work, but produce diminishing returns. Failures in front of the cooking pot, meanwhile, result in dubious food, which in a delightful touch is pixelated. Link will still choke it down. <sighs> Meals aren't the only way to restore hearts. You can simply sleep at an inn or in a random bed. And if you choose the soft bed option at one of the inns or stables around Hyrule, you'll get a bonus heart. Ah. Of course, cooking is the best way to boost your hearts well beyond their current level. <sighs> Staying on the subject of bonus stats, there are actually two inns that stand head and shoulders above the rest. If you choose the bed and massage option in Goron City, or the spa plan in Gerudo Town, you'll come away with three extra hearts and an extra stamina wheel. Vota. Link also winds up with some fond memories. <laughs> <laughs> Breath of the Wild rewards exploration in so many different ways, and everything you do serves an end goal. From cooking meals and making money, <laughs> to upgrading your armor sets. Even the least usable plants, animals, and monster parts can be utilized in a variety of ways. We all know the Yiga clan are obsessed with bananas, but you can even take advantage of this in their hideout. Nothing piques the interest of guards quite like a bunch of bananas. I also love the fact that the Yiga Clan symbol is an upside down Sheikah eye. This group were once Sheikahs after all before they flipped and became acolytes of Calamity Ganon. The link between the Yiga and the Sheikah can be seen in another way too. Monk Mazkosha has a similar reaction to the Yiga guards if you drop some bananas while you're facing him. <laughs> it only works once in the fight, but can be used to discover the true foe amongst the clones. Sadly, supersized Maz cares not for puny bananas. Back to cooking. Remember the first time that little melody played when you were cooking and you got an extra special dish? <laughs> Generally, a critical success like this is random, but there are a couple of ways to ensure it happens. One is by cooking using a star fragment or a dragon part. The other is by taking advantage of a blood moon. If you can get to a cooking pot as a blood moon rises, there's a block of time during which everything you cook will have Link leaping into the air with joy. <laughs> Simply watch the clock and once it hits 11.30pm, start cooking. The blood moon cutscene will happen at midnight, but you can still keep cooking after this. <laughs> My experiments found that the critical cuisine continued until the clock ticked over to 12.15am. <laughs> Blood moons are also useful when you're running low on gear. Not only do they respawn enemies and weapons lying around the world, they also reset tests of strength. Fresh ancient weapons and shields? Don't mind if I do. 
This brings us neatly to Fighting Guardians. These foes are among the most challenging in Breath of the Wild early on, but there are a variety of ways to tackle them. You can shoot a Guardian in the eye to momentarily stun it and get some hits in. This also goes for Lionels, Hinoxes, and Stalnoxes. And in general, headshots equals critical damage. That's what that ping sound means. Guardian Stalkers can be immobilized by systematically cutting their legs off. This also yields bonus Guardian parts. If you blow up the propellers of a Guardian Skywatcher, you'll send it crashing to the ground. You can parry a Guardian's laser back with any shield, including makeshift ones like pot lids. Just be aware that failing to land a perfect parry can instantly destroy your shield. The best option for facing Guardians is the Ancient Shield, which will parry lasers back automatically. Given the right situation, Link can also parry more than one Guardian laser back at a time. Parrying attacks against normal enemies is useful too, either staggering them or disarming them. Link can also knock back projectiles, and not just with his shield, also with a bat, a bow, and with the Zora Helm. Oh, and did I mention he can perfect parry bees? Bees! Of course, the best of the lot and deserving of its own point is parrying a literal bacoblin. Thanks for the alley-oop, Moblin pal. Oh, and don't forget that if you're wielding a Lionel shield, parrying can also be used to deal damage. Remember that tip about shooting enemies in the eye? Well, after a couple of ocular assaults, Hinoxes and Stalnoxes will start shielding theirs. I mean, they've only got one, Link. Why you gotta be like this? Staying on the topic of cruelty to the misunderstood native fauna of Hyrule, if a Hinox has wooden leg armor, you can burn it off to more easily hack the bone. And if it's metal, well, it's time for shock and awe tactics. That's awe as in, oh, you killed that poor gentle giant. You know you woke him up from his nap, right? Okay, this is really taking things too far. You're killing it with a motorcycle? You're a monster, Link. The less bloodthirsty can avoid fighting Hinoxes altogether. Simply sneak onto its hand and hit your eye. Now, steal all his stuff. Steal it. Sleeping Hinoxes are secretly also a launch pad. Frozen Bacoblins are too. Unfrozen Bacoblins are some of the most entertaining enemies in the game. They can be easily distracted by food and will even throw tantrums if they miss out. So will Moblins. Bacoblins are distracted by wild animals too. Remote bombs always draw the attention of enemies. They'll even try and kick them away. If you come across an enemy camp at night, you can sneak in and steal all the weapons while everyone's asleep. Better still, you can leave other weapons behind and when they wake up, they'll pick up whatever is to hand. Hilarity will ensue. Oh, and while we're talking about sneaking about, Link can hop forward while crouching. The Zalfos often wield boomerang weapons. It makes sense then that they can actually catch boomerangs if Link throws one at them. And unlike Bacoblin or Moblin arms, even the Zalfos arms will return to sender. They can catch those too. Bacoblins, Moblins and the Zalfos, as well as their Stal brethren, have no qualms about wielding monster arms against Link. They can also simply reattach them if need be. Detached arms remain magically animated, whether on the ground or in hand. When it comes to Stal Coblins, Stal Moblins, and Stal Azalfos, knocking these creatures of the night to pieces isn't enough to finish them off. You also need to destroy their skulls, otherwise they'll put themselves back together. They can even mix and match parts. The punt animation has to be one of the most satisfying in the entire game. If there are no weapons nearby, enemies will scrounge around for anything they can use. Rocks, explosive barrels, tree branches, trees. Buried explosive barrels, you get the idea. Link can repeatedly sneak strike enemies using this simple technique. Many smaller enemies can't swim. They can also be slid around while frozen. Most enemies can't fly either. Man, Croc leaves can do some work. Korok leaves are also useful for fanning rafts, but wearing the appropriate attire can make a big difference. 
You don't necessarily need a leaf to move a raft. A big metal object can also do the trick. I'm not very good at this. I don't know about you, but it was ages before I realized holding down ZL gave Link four additional selfie poses. Better still, the weapon pose even changes based on what Link has equipped. If Link isn't wearing a shirt, he'll eventually flex. Some of my favorite animations in Breath of the Wild are found at the game's fairy fountains. I particularly love the fact that there's a different animation for each tier of upgrade. <laughs> Oh, and while you're at a fairy fountain, you can actually gather bonus fairies. Generally, the game only wants you to have three in your inventory, but if you hold those in hand, it will spawn in more. Bonus bootleg Mifa's grace! Breath of the Wild is full of fun NPC interactions. Shucky. They'll react to different outfits, <laughs> tell Link not to be a jerk, yeah. and try and stop him leaping off the world's lowest bridge. They'll also, naturally, be unhappy if Link draws a bow on them or pulls out a bomb or tries to steal their stuff. Ah. Guards also will attack back if Link harasses them, <coughs> but he won't take damage. Let's talk about some of the things that make runes special. You can use stasis to see all the items that can be picked in an area. You can also use stasis once it's upgraded to give you information about enemies. You'll be able to spot camouflage as Alphos and you'll be able to see which decayed guardians will come back to life. Stasis can also do weird things to guardian stalkers if they're not active. Stasis can prevent easily breakable objects from, uh, breaking. You can use this to send tree trunks and crates flying and even hitch a ride. Oh, and if you want to change the direction an object in stasis is going to fly, point the way with an arrow. You can knock bokos off horses using stasis. You can also use ice arrows, shock arrows, fire arrows, and ancient arrows. They're not quite as comical, however. You can use stasis on pressure plates to keep them held down for a while or to solve puzzles in a different way. Inventory items can also be used to weight down switches. Metal Gear conducts electricity so it can solve circuit puzzles. Magnesis is invaluable for spotting treasure chests in bodies of water and other places. Magnesis can be used to drop heavy stuff on enemies and also to just bash things into them. The amiibo rune can be used to hit Yeager assassins with treasure chests. Remote bombs can be dropped and detonated while paragliding. And if you drop and detonate them just so, you'll send Link flying. This technique is called the bomb impact launch and I guess shouldn't count as a tiny thing because, well, it massively changes the way you can move around Hyrule. But hey, I love it and this is my video, so it stays. There are a bunch of ways to do it too. Link isn't the only thing that could be launched in Breath of the Wild. You can use Cryonus blocks to blast objects like Guardian Stalkers into space. Another thing you can do with Cryonus is use it to ascend waterfalls. Sure, once you have the Zora armor, this is largely moot, but still. Breakable weapons are one of the core design pillars of Breath of the Wild, but the champion's weapons can in fact be repaired. Well, forged anew, really. The Master Sword, meanwhile, doesn't break, but it does run out of energy and need to recharge. That's not the only thing that makes this sword magical. If Link is at full health, it can shoot beams of energy, which can be aimed by holding R. Elemental rods can be aimed in the same way. <coughs> Like weapons, shields also break, but once you've built Tarrytown, any time your Hylian shield busts, you can simply buy another. Ah. You can also craft a range of ancient weapons from the Akala Tech Lab. Want to ensure you get the best option out of every drop? Well, if the outcome is randomized, you can reload your save until you get what you want. This is most useful with things like amiibo chests or acquiring the exact gear you're after. Want a five-shot Lionel bow as opposed to three? Save before an appropriate Lionel fight and keep loading into it until you see five shots coming Link's way. 
You can use Rock Octoroks, which are all located in the vicinity of Death Mountain, to clean rusty gear. They can be a little overzealous when they spit things back, however. Different Octoroks disguise themselves under a variety of objects, including saplings, bushes, rocks, and fake treasure chests. You can tell they're fake because they don't show up when using stasis or magnesis. Octo balloons are a lot of fun, whether you're removing a boko weapon from the battlefield, temporarily, or taking to the skies yourself. Some actions don't use up a weapon's durability. These include shooting energy beams with the master sword, riding a lionel, and starting a campfire. The more primitive enemies will be fooled indefinitely when Link wears the appropriate mask, unless he gives himself away. Lionels, on the other hand, are a bit smarter than that. Wait for it. Wait for it. There you go. I also love how Link imitates the body language of each of the different species. Let's talk about arrows. You can pick up arrows that enemies fire at you. You can often retrieve your own too. If you need more arrows, head to this spot. Treasure chests on Eventide Island respawn every time you arrive, so you can retrieve this one over and over again. Obviously, it's a lot easier once you have the travel medallion. Bomb arrows will instantly detonate in and around Death Mountain. Regular arrows, meanwhile, will become fire arrows. And if you toss wood on the ground, it will instantly turn into a campfire, and the campfire keeps burning after you've used it instead of going out. Bomb arrows won't explode when it's raining. Shoot an enemy with a shock arrow in the rain, on the other hand, and it will create a large electric field. This works on other enemies too, including the undead and Lynels. Speaking of enemies in the rain, fire keys lose their fire and then die. Fire choo-choos also. Updrafts can still be created in the rain using things like red choo-choo jelly, spicy peppers, and fire arrows. Why fire arrows don't go out, I have no idea. Each wandering merchant has a unique list of items to sell and many will even have different stock in the rain. Rain can change the landscape too. Some areas will flood and then return to normal when the sun comes back out. Here's a fact you may not know, Link loves playing in puddles. Thunderstorms are a powerful force in Breath of the Wild. Link will be far more likely to get struck by lightning if he has any metallic gear equipped. These storms can be used to your advantage, however, either by setting lightning traps or by timing a weapon throw just so. I also love how much Bokos flip out when lightning strikes. Fair enough, really. That was pretty close. Link can disarm enemies using thunderstorm rods, shock arrows, and other elemental weapons. Of course, he can be disarmed by electricity sometimes too. If you shoot a metal crate with a shock arrow, it creates a large electric field. Water does the same. You can one-shot whiz robes by taking advantage of their elemental weaknesses. Same with Lizalfos. You can charge up elemental rods. Choo-choos can be shot to do elemental damage to nearby enemies. Blue choo-choos can be transformed from boring old vanilla to all the elements of the bow, man. Sorry, did I say bow? That was a typo, I meant botwa. That is an awkward acronym to say out loud. If you shoot non-guardian enemies with an ancient arrow, they're vaporized or something along with all their gear. Shooting a shock arrow into water will kill the fish. Obosa's fury, strangely, won't. You can also fish with dynamite, or the botwa equivalent. Cronus blocks can also work, although it's a lot easier lifting up floating treasure chests. My favorite way to fish is by whistling for my supper. Horses are a big part of Breath of the Wild, at least early on. You don't have to sneak up to a horse to tame it, you can always just land on its back, or shock it with an arrow. 
Ah, let's try again. I deserve that. Horses with spots, or that are coloured light brown or pink, are gentle horses and have weaker stats. Horses in solid colours, aside from the two I just mentioned, will be wild horses and have higher stats. Some stables have attendants who can help you customise your horse. Just make sure you're well bonded with it. You can sue the horse while riding to improve your bond, but the quickest way is feeding it apples. <laughs> The ancient bridle gives your horse two extra spurs. If you feed your horse an Endura carrot, it will then have another three additional spurs, but these are only temporary. The ancient saddle lets Link whistle for his horse no matter where it is. The giant horse is the only one in the game that can't be spurred into a gallop. Thankfully its canter is pretty quick to begin with. Did your favourite horse get caught in the crossfire? Never fear, the horse god Melania can resurrect it. It's like visiting a fairy fountain, only there's less kissing and hugging <laughs> and more veiled threats masquerading as jokes. <laughs> good, good one. Link can also ride creatures like deer and bears. And he's not the only one. Yep, them rhino rustling boko bear bandits are up to their old tricks again, consarn it. What else? If you visit Satori Mountain when it's glowing green, you can see the Lord of the Mountain, which you can also ride, of course. Seriously, this game's got more riders than a Van Halen tour, or some other more current reference. And let's not forget about stall horses. These misunderstood bony beasts can also be ridden, but sadly, won't last long. They can't be stabled. Of course, eventually you'll get the Master Cycle Zero. This mystical motorcycle can do donuts, wheelies, jumps. There's more to it than I realised at first. Oh, also, shooting arrows and beam attacks, doing power slides, crashing, I totally meant to do that. And why not ride around twirling a spear in the air? Pretty cool look. You can do it on horseback too, and whatever else you care to hop on top of. <laughs> Let's talk about cuckoos. Attack or scare one, and there's a chance it'll lay a fresh egg on the spot. That's a fear egg. They taste extra delicious. Attack a cuckoo four times and you'll trigger a swarm. Best to let an enemy get that fourth hit in. Sick of paragliding? Why not travel in style? On a slightly more ethereal note, this glowing bunny owl thing is a bloopy, and if you shoot it, it will shower the ground with blood. Rupee shaped blood. What a delight. Dragons present a slightly larger target, but are equally impervious to Link's repeated raids on their horns, fangs, claws, and scales. Hmm, these horns are clearly the most logical thing to enhance my champion's tunic. Breath of the Wild also plays host to the ultimate game of hide and seek between Link and 900 forest spirits. The prize may not be worth it, but the game sure is fun. And hey, if you're getting sick of their maddeningly cheery yahaha, -ha, yeah. well, you can always drop a rock on a Korok. <laughs> Last point on the creatures of Hyrule. I just absolutely love that you can go up to the stable dogs and pat them. Wait, what? Where's the pat option? Well, this just dropped from a 10 out of 10 to a still easily a 10 out of 10. What if I feed you? Hey, where are you going? Oh well, I guess that's a consolation prize of sorts. And leads neatly to two super cool ways to open chests. One, without pants. Two, by punching them. Mind you, why open a treasure chest the old-fashioned way when you could just blow it up, burn it out, or smash it open? Warning, your mileage may vary depending on the construction material of said chest. Let's pause for a moment and take a look at the map. See that treasure chest next to the shrine's name? That means you've found all its treasure. As you complete each divine beast, it appears in the loading screen, bopping along. If you're unhappy with how you've allocated Link hearts versus stamina, head on over to the horned statue at Hatenyo Village and change it up. Nothing like making a blood pact with a mysterious ancient god. Almost done now, a couple of my favourite things at night. Shooting stars, 
There's nothing quite like seeing one and immediately abandoning whatever you are doing to try and get over to it in time. Yellow shooting stars yield a star fragment, while red shooting stars are actually treasure chests. And how about this? Up near Hebra Peak on clear nights, you'll sometimes get to see Hyrule's equivalent of the Northern Lights. What a night, what a sight! Two more, and this one's a big tiny thing. The fact that you can save almost anywhere is one of the key foundations for Breath of the Wild being as fun as it is. It means you're never punished for experimenting and trying different things. You can always rewind your mistakes. Bless you, Nintendo. And lastly, when you do hit the game over screen, the text colour will sometimes reflect how Link died. For most deaths, the text will be red. But if you are electrocuted, it'll be yellow. Whereas if you died from the cold or drowning, it'll be light blue. It's just one more thoughtful touch out of hundreds, if not thousands. Game over? After four years, it's clear that Breath of the Wild will live forever. For more on Breath of the Wild, check out IGN's guide to the bomb impact launch, and be sure to rewatch the Breath of the Wild 2 trailer again. For everything else, stick with IGN.